Hey everybody, welcome to this week's q and A's. I'm doing it a day early just for scheduling reasons, so if your questions came in after I started recording, my apologies, just please ask again next week. Uh, and also, if anybody noticed last week, the volume was getting progressively quieter as the Q&As went on. I didn't realize till later on in the Q&As, but my arm for the microphone here was just slowly sinking. And I didn't quite realize it till the end, and then I, I lifted it back up, and when I went to look at the waveform afterwards to post the audio-only version, you saw it getting small all the way across. So my apologies for that. I tried to clean it up as well as possible, and I'll try to pay attention to my mic today. I'd really prefer using a boom mic or something, but there's just no possible way I could do that in this setup. There's even construction going outside right now that hopefully this specific mic will cut out. So if anybody listens with headphones, they're not going to get a headache or anything. But as always, I mean, I'm always open to any suggestions, but trying my best. and <laughs> Hopefully I won't make silly mistakes like that, uh, like I did last week. Okay, I'll start with the newest post this week, because why not? Uh, Bad Reality wants to know if it's possible to mod a non-OSD television set for RGBS, like literally soldered directly to the RGB electron guns. Sometimes. So, uh, a super quick overview. How most people RGB mod TVs is they go into the on-screen display, and that's why the on-screen display's lettering, like volume brightness, is always so much sharper than a lot of the TV signals you'll see. It's because it's RGB onto the tube as opposed to composite or RF. So people tap into the RGBS signals of that, feed in an input, uh, calibrate it to make sure it's the right voltage, and there you go. Now you're able to feed RGB directly into a consumer TV that didn't previously support it. Now, for non-OSD TVs, some of them it's possible to go to the gun, and I guess some of the ones that do have OSDs anyway, but now you're treating it like you would uh, an arcade monitor. So there's a lot of things involved, there's a lot of setups, and if you were just going to do something like, oh, I have a you know, a, a Street Fighter cabinet, I want to replace the tube with another one. That is very possible and it could be done. Uh, in fact, I think both of the Neo Geo cabs uh, at Brooklyn Video Games now have tube replacements and they look amazing. Um, but if you're just looking for a general idea of, hey, I have a TV that's, you know, in mint condition, but no OSD, can I just tap into that? It's a lot more complicated, and there's a lot more things to go wrong. And also, any uh, game console that outputs a different line count, so like SNES 256 versus Genesis 320 games or Saturn, it, it's not as easy to realign things. You'd have to go in there and mess with the tube every time you had something that was different. Um, and I kind of dealt with this a lot when I did uh, a MAME cabinet going into in what was it, a Mortal Kombat arcade board with a MAME box that outputted original resolutions and timings. And by doing so, every time I played certain games, sides would be cut off, top and bottom would be cut off. That's actually why MAME works the way it does without using these custom things, is so that you could fit it in the same screen. So the short answer to your question is, yes, it's possible in some cases, but it's really not recommended unless it's for a single board, single monitor environment. So if you did want to do something crazy like have a TV just for Super Nintendo, sure, but it's a lot of work uh, and a lot more complicated than finding one that's compatible with an OSD RGB mod. Gold Saturn was wondering what my recommendation is for getting RGBS suitable to hook up to a GSCAR in OSSC from a consolized MVS. Uh, so the, the reason Gold Saturn's asking this question is because you need to make sure that the red, green, blue, sync, and audio channels are all being outputted at the proper voltage for SCART compatible equipment. Um, so it's a good question and it's a very important question. Um, Gold Saturn linked to an OSH Park board that claims that it's, uh, it's good for JAMA, uh, for JAMA to SCART. However, each board's gonna be slightly different. So what I would suggest, depending on your setup, is to either buy something, depending on your um, on your budget, you could get a HAS, the Home Arcade System Super Gun, uh, and that'll work with, uh, with pretty much every JAMA arcade board. You could get the Mini Gun, um, which it's, it's a little bit more tweaking involved depending on the setup, uh, and it has potentiometers for the RGB lines, and it should be set in a somewhat safe range, but there is an audio protection circuit, so you never have to worry about the audio on it, uh, and sync should be fine as well. And there is a couple of custom specific to Neo Geo 
uh, super guns, if you want to call them that, out there uh, that are only really designed for the Neo Geo. Now, they could be used on other things, but it's one of those like, hey, your mileage will vary, make sure to check with a scope, but if you plug it into a Neo Geo, it's totally safe. Um, I showed a prototype of this in a video a while back, uh, and I have had nothing but good luck. And I've had good luck on all accounts. So uh, one problem that we talk about a lot in these Q and A's is people with certain model AES consoles that aren't compatible with the Rad 2X. And we think it's the way the AES circuit for specific motherboard revisions was improperly made. Um, or I guess improperly might be harsh because it works on a CRT, but improperly for the, the, in the, the scope of getting things to work on digital devices. But this board worked perfect with the Rad 2X. Also, the colors and brightness came out fine, and it also has audio protection in it. So that's my choice. Um, maybe just reach out directly through the, the uh, DMs or PMs or whatever it is on uh, on Patreon, and I'll get you in touch with the person making them. Uh, I think I'd still call it prototype phase because there hasn't been a production run yet, but I've been using mine for almost a year now. So, um, you know, it's safe to use. And if there's anything added after this point, it's going to be nitpicking, cleaning stuff up or, or stuff that doesn't affect what you're worried about, making sure to get a solid RGBS signal that's not unsafe to use with SCART equipment. Totally awesome for that. Um, and also, uh, if you have a ROM cart, you're able to dial in optimal timings with the OSSC, including with uh, setting phase and all that stuff. So having a really good board like this would really get you the highest quality output reasonably um, ex reasonably expected without doing some kind of crazy mod to it. Like as far as plug and play mods, this is going to equal or surpass any AES. Uh, so yeah, message me about that and hopefully the project will get hit public pretty soon. Mr. Pete1985 wanted to know if there's any add-on boards for the Mr. to use real cartridges or anything like that in the works. Um, as far as I know, the answer is no, because of what we were discussing about last week or the week before about um, how the DE10 Nano doesn't allow access to every single pin on the FPGA, which would make it more complicated, but not impossible, to add a cartridge slot. Now, I'm oversimplifying, so if there's any of the Mr. Devs listening, please don't reach through the screen and smack me in the face. I'm just trying to keep this to a reasonable <laughs> reasonable time frame. Uh, so I, I think it's possible, but I don't know of anybody working on it. And in my opinion, there's a different way to go about doing specific things like this. That's just an opinion, by the way. That's not fact at all. So uh, I wouldn't hold my breath for it, but there might be other solutions out there that are kind of, that would work decently well. Matthew Underwood said in their setup, they have an N64 going composite into a RetroTINK 2X into a Panasonic Plasma TV. It displays fine in the EverDrive menu, but they get a black screen once they get into the game. The audio comes through fine though. This also seems fairly inconsistent. I suspect it has to do with the different resolutions the games run in on N64, but I can't figure out a consistent cause for it. All my other systems seem to show up fine. Any idea what this could be? Um, for context, there's a lot of other stuff going on with my setup, but I'm essentially running eight different systems, all composite, to a CRT, the HDTV, and a capture card, but I don't see how these things should affect the problem. I think that is a problem, but coming back. Also, it's tough being a composite kid. Is there any source for composite switches that have more than eight inputs or just anything of higher quality than the absolute garbage solutions on Amazon? My switch and splitter are shorting out all the time. Thanks a bunch for your videos. Uh, you and LGR are, talk are talking to sleep every night with your cozy tech talk. Well, glad we could provide entertainment. I think I have the solution to your problem, though. If you're simply splitting a composite video signal without a distribution amp, you're dropping the voltage and brightness down on each time that you split it, and you're putting a lot of pressure on the console itself to, to provide the signal to all of those different devices. So if you have a passive switch with some Y cables and stuff like that, that's definitely the cause of your problem. However, the both of your questions can be solved with one device. If you wanna pick up a basic Xtron, uh, Xtron switch, you should be able to use um, uh, any, uh, you should just look for any Xtron uh, distribution amplifier that's composite video compatible. 
So you're going to have to buy those RCA to BNC connectors, which are super cheap. And for what you're doing, I would suggest buying a bag of 20. And if you get one that sometimes if you wiggle it, you drop signal, just throw that in the garbage, grab another one. I wouldn't spend like the $3 each on the super good ones because it's not going to matter in this case. That's only really mattering for super high end capture setups or using a scope and stuff like that. So I think that might be your solution is looking for used distribution amplifiers or um, which and matrix switches all do kind of the same thing. So if you had an RGB setup, for example, you can buy an Extron Crosspoint 12 by 12 and have 12 inputs and 12 outputs and it's completely safe to run all 12 out at the same time. You're not putting any more stress on the original console from that. It's a perfectly good solution. Um, so I think that would be the best idea. Look for composite video compatible. So you can't just get an Extron Crosspoint RGB switch, I think. Um, you might be able to run composite video through like the RG or B lines, but uh, I, I don't know. I would really look into this to double check. Uh, but anything that's the Extron equipment that's a matrix switch that's specifically compatible with composite video should be a good solution for you. Um, just check the, you know, check eBay listings and then also cross reference like the data sheets and stuff like that. Um, and let me know, uh, you know, let me know uh, how it goes for you. Uh, I think that should be it. And if you want to double check this, just go directly from the N64 into the uh, RetroTank 2X um, and see if that fixes the issue. And if it doesn't, try a different composite video cable just for the heck of it. Um, also, if you have any way to test directly into a CRT, I would also double check that composite into a CRT isn't doing the same thing. Because if you had been using a bunch of splitters, a passive splitters, you could have done damage to the video encoder on the N64. Since it's still working at all, I think that's the least likely, but I just wanted to add some extra test points at the end, uh, just so you could double check yourself to make sure you have a good line of troubleshooting. Kelv SYC wanted to follow up on last week and had another question. Uh, so the follow up was indeed, regardless of the Wii's settings, their display will always interpret the Wii's component video output as a 4x3 signal, even when set to 16x9 anamorphic widescreen. Similarly, the display refuses to stretch an anamorphic widescreen display or widescreen signal to a proper 16x9 and will only show it as 4x3. It could stretch to what they call 16x9, but it's a setting that clips a significant chunk of the picture, but even then that causes extensive, extensive amounts of display lag. This might sound weird, but try one of those analog to digital converters, so just a component to HDMI box. Uh, they're like 20, 20 bucks on Amazon. They're in the Amazon link in the description. Give one of those a shot and see if your HDMI input will interpret it differently. It's going to sound really weird, I know. However, I've seen a bunch of TVs in the past few years add analog uh, ports as like an aside. Like they probably spend 50 cents on the board. And, you know, the, the RCA connectors probably cost more than everything else combined to get that circuit working just because they want to add the feature, but they don't, they know most people probably aren't using it anymore. Uh, I've definitely seen things like um, HDMI inputs process 240p properly, but uh, composite and component don't. Weird, weird stuff like that. So give that a try and see if that's a, a solution. Um, and you know that might be a, a box that's worth leaving in your tool, your toolbox, if you will, anyway. Because those those analog to digital and digital to analog converters, I have a whole box sitting right here. And at one point, I was like, ah. Eh, I never use these things, you know, let me just get rid of them. And I said, yeah, I think I should hold on to them. I probably use it like twice a week now, at least one thing in here. So, you know, not, not forcing you to get one, just saying if you buy it just for this experiment, it'll be a tool that you probably will use again, especially hearing all of your different setups and stuff like that. Uh, the question though, the height def nest mod allows for a no cut installation of the high def nest by raising the height of the top loader or a, or front loader um, uh, eight bit Nintendo consoles. Are there any known efforts to have other case extensions mod case extensions made to have other popular mods like the Wii dual or DC digital in a no cut manner? Um, so the answer is sort of kinda. I think everybody nowadays is always taking into the fact, uh, taking into consideration the fact that you know no cut mods is important. And I think even a few years ago, I think even right about the time that I started the hashtag no cut mod thing, 
people didn't take it quite as seriously. But now you're seeing consoles that had um, composite video mods hacked in, and then those were removed for RGB mods, and now those could potentially be re removed for HDMI mods. So now you just have Swiss cheese in the back of your console. So it is something that every single developer that I've talked to is always trying for. Sometimes there isn't a way to pull it off, or sometimes it'll just add so much cost. It would actually be cheaper for somebody to go buy an aftermarket case and then mod the aftermarket case. In the case of the Wii Duel, um, that was certainly the, uh, the, the scenario as well, as Dan put a lot of effort into making all of that work exactly the way it did. Um, and, it, you know, there's a lot of beat-up Wiis out there, and there's also a lot of really, really nice... Um, like I like some of the clear aftermarket cases and stuff like that. So I think that was the case with that one. DC Digital, same thing if you really... Like, I have a the, the Black Sports Edition Dreamcast, which I do not want to cut at all. Um, so I just picked up a, a beat up Dreamcast that was barely working, did a gut swap, and there you go. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's that's kind of the, the goal is they're trying to do no cut mods and they're trying to come out with ways to do it without cutting. Uh, people like Greg are always hunting down different ways like he did with the N64. Now all you have to do is use his different spacer uh, and then you would have to cut your HDMI cable, but I don't really think anybody cares about that respectfully. <laughs> you know, a $10 cable that you could cut that's still perfectly workable. You just see a little bit less of the rubber. Perfectly good solution in my opinion. So, um... Uh, and you said, yes, the the mod for the N64 does block both the analog and digital ports at the same time. Um, you know, I, does it, though? If you get a, a very small cable, are you able to fit them both in? I don't remember if I ever tested this, but... Anyway, um, I'm 100% on your page about wanting no-cut mods, uh, and I think that everybody that I've talked to is really trying. It's just a matter of what's the, the most reasonable thing to do, um, and hopefully Greg will keep coming up with some crazy new ideas, and developers will keep coming up with new ways to route these things so you don't have to cut, but great question. It's just it's work in progress, I guess, is the best way to put it. Focus had a few questions about modding a Virtual Boy, um, and I have a couple of different answers to this. So first, uh, they're looking to mod a Virtual Boy with the Virtual Tap, but still retain functionality of the Virtual Boy, and try to do that in a no-cut mod. Um, and I don't know of anybody who is making any parts to do that. I think the only way that you could do it now at this point is to either make your own 3D shell, which means design your own and print your own, uh, to replace the bottom part, or you could probably pull something off like uh, remove the controller input port and then use something, you could use the original or you could probably use something like Kevin Mellet's 3D printed uh, extension cable. Um, you could use the ends of that and just have it that and the uh, any kind of other output you need dangling out of the, virt the virtual boy. You would just wanna make sure to have some very good cable management inside of there because if you pulled that or put too much pressure, not only can you rip it out, you could pull traces, damage components, but that's certainly plausible and it's something I've done with the Atari 2600s. I just leave the the output din dangling. It's not the prettiest solution, but it's a no-cut mod, and I don't think it's ugly. It might not be as as uh, artistic looking as some of the the really beautiful mods I've seen, but certainly was fine as long as you do it right. Um, the other question you had is about the output connector. Uh, so. The output connector has a couple of different factors. First of all, RGB versus VGA. I would, in almost all cases, recommend that you use the VGA output because you get the proper aspect ratio and you could use it on a VGA monitor. You could uh, use it through a capture card. If you wanted, you could do an HDMI converter and, and use it on a flat panel. The only reason I would suggest anybody add RGB is if you specifically wanted to use it on an RGB monitor. And the aspect ratio is a little bit different. I think it's squished a little bit in one way. Um, and I wanted both because I'm me and I'm nuts and I, I want these things. And I thought it looked pretty amazing when we did the Virtual Boy um, tournament for the Street Fighter tournament at the event. Because uh, we had two Virtual Boys head to head. We had an RGB monitor, a Sony PVM playing Street Fighter. So it had the 240p look of Street Fighter just in, you know, in all red. Um, and then we were also able to stream the proper aspect ratio with the VGA connector. But unless you 
have a specific need for you really want to game on an RGB monitor, I would just use the VGA connector. And then of course, use a standard VGA jack. And then that would solve everything. You just use a VGA cable, and then you use an audio cable or a 3.5 millimeter audio cable for the headphone jack. Headphone jack's pretty noisy. Maybe someday we could all figure out a better audio mod, like a line level audio mod for the Virtual Boy. Uh, vir yeah, Virtual Boy and Virtual Tap. Um, when you're when you do use the RGB output though, um, the virtual tap outputs the proper RGBS signal, and as most people probably know who follow the channel, but if you're new to this, you might not. Almost all of these consoles from back in the day have components in the cables because the manufacturers wanted to save money on the console design and save, you know, testing and all that stuff. So capacitors and resistors are that are needed to complete the RGB signal are in the cable, not on the motherboard. So in this case, if you were to use a like a SNES style multi out for the RGB output and use a SNES cable, you're actually changing the signal. So you would either need to mod that SNES cable or mod the virtual tap. Now, I don't think you should do that at all, just my personal opinion. I, I've expressed this before with that amazing looking virtual tap uh, case that, that was released. I don't think that should be the answer. I know it's kind of neat to have a Nintendo console with a Nintendo multi out, but I think that changing the output of something is always risky. If you wanted to do it, I would try to mod the virtual tap itself. Uh, there should be, uh, there's other people that did it, so you, you could probably reach out to people who, who might have pulled this off before, but I never, ever recommend um, modifying the cables because I think it's very easy for us to think in the, the bubbles of our own lives, and it's easy to forget that these consoles will probably outlast us, and at some other point, somebody's going to grab that SNES RGB cable and go, oh, a Super Nintendo RGB SCART cable, plug it into their console, plug it into something else, and that's very bad, because that modded cable that you have is now not outputting the proper signal. So that's why if you use an 8-pin mini DIN, that's not a real thing. That's not. There's never been a console that outputted that. Uh, there's only been the XRGB mini that inputted it. So we just use that pin out. Um, and you know, also if people see that, they're gonna know. Well, that's not from a console. So let's let's test it. Let's step back a second. Whereas people using the SNES multi out, Genesis 2 multi out, that are outputting non-compliant signals, that could cause some serious issues. So. Um, my, my very strong suggestion to you is if you, uh, if you are going to use RGB out and you insist on using the SNES multi out, whatever mods you have to make, try to make it to the virtual tap so that you could just use a standard SNES cable and you don't have to worry about any potential damage in the future. Lastly, Focus just wanted to follow up on some of the uh, Lightberry and HDMI stuff. Um, a Lightberry is something that scans the border of a, a video signal and outputs the matching color value to LEDs behind the TV, making for some cool lighting effects while gaming or while watching TV and stuff. Um, I've seen those. I think they look awesome, and that is 100% preference. For me personally, I prefer minimal lighting in a room and you know you shouldn't have it pitch black because I don't I think you're essentially then staring into a flashlight uh you know of course you could adjust the brightness le brightness levels and stuff but I have just a tiny bit of ambient lighting I have something called a tittle look it up it's actually a, a pretty neat device that I usually leave in lava lamp mode anybody that's interested in that I could do a video it's not retro gaming related but it's a, just a fun neat device that I, I always thought was kind of cool um and uh, you also mentioned HDMI switchers and splitters, uh, and you said that you had some luck with them, but remember to read that the main 4K display should be out on output one and check the EDID readings. Um, I haven't had time to jump back into testing that stuff. I haven't had time for most things, to be honest with you. I still have a giant pile on top of my BVM of stuff I need to review. I think a few people are getting upset that I haven't gotten to it yet. So I'll punch through those as reasonably quickly as I can and then try to get back to HDMI testing at some point in the future. But I you know, respectfully rely on awesome people like you feeding everybody the info from your test results. So thanks for posting here. Definitely post in shmups uh, if you find something noteworthy. And of course, thanks to Dave again for starting that. 
Well, that's kind of a short one this week, obviously, because I did it a day early. And uh, honestly, you know, I've always kind of thought that I'd rather do it off schedule than skip the Q&A altogether. But at the end of the day, I just want to do whatever all of you prefer. So if you would prefer that, uh, you know, rather than have it out a day early and kind of shorter, I just wait till next week, get a long one and have it out exactly on Friday evening or something. Just let me know. Respectfully, I really don't care. I just I enjoy doing these. I want to do them however that you all would prefer that I do them. Um, also, for anybody new to these, uh, ask any questions that you have wherever it is that you support. At the moment, it's Patreon, Floatplane, and YouTube. I have to leave comments on the YouTube videos of these for algorithm reasons, but respectfully, while I answer comments and questions on YouTube all day long on other videos, these Q&As are really just a thank you to everybody that supports and an awesome way that I get to interact with everybody. So no disrespect, but I'm not really reading any of the comments from the Q&A videos, only the other ones. Uh, answer all questions here and just post wherever the latest Q&A post is because I can't just sift through and there is no like comment tab on Patreon or Floatplane where I could just see what are the newest. Uh, so it just makes it easier if you post wherever the latest post is. And if I miss your question, it's almost always going to be an accident. Uh, either that or I, I didn't read the question right or something like that. Um, you know, this week, you might have posted a question after this video was rendering, but not up yet. Other weeks, I accidentally delete them in post while I'm, <laughs> while I'm editing it. Sorry. So just wanted to kind of put that out there for everybody new to these. But as always, thank you all so much for doing this. Thank you for your supports. Uh, and I will see you next week.